Hi, my name is Jay Sugarman, and I want to welcome you to Innovation Showcase. The main purpose of this ongoing series is to inform viewers about exciting innovations and creative individuals across the fields of business, science, technology, education, and the arts. Today via Zoom, we're fortunate to have as our guests, Laura Prieto, Molly Copeland, Erin Wiebe, and Anna Boyles, all of whom are associated with the Mary Eliza Project a noteworthy undertaking to create a searchable database of the more than 50,000 women who registered to vote in Boston in the months after they gained voting rights from the 19th Amendment in 1920. Lara is a co-director of the project and Anna, Molly, and Erin are all team members. During the program, we're finding out why and how the Mary Eliza project came about, how it's grown and developed, and in the process will come to better understand and appreciate the rich and wide range of information the transcribed data tells us about the women who registered to vote then. Let's start by meeting our guest and then hearing all about the Mary Eliza Project. Welcome, so delighted you're all able to be here. I've been learning so much. It's been fascinating reading about the project, delving a little bit into the database, eager to find out more and have you inform viewers. But before we jump right to that, I think it would be of interest if each of you would just briefly say a little bit about your backgrounds, professional interests, current position. Laura, would you please start? Great, thank you. And thank you so much, Dave, for having us on your show. Um, it's a real pleasure. I'm, uh, again, Laura Prieto. Uh, my title is a professor. I'm a professor of history at Simmons University. I'm also the chair in public humanities uh, there at the moment, and that's very much in line with this work. Um, I'm a trained historian. Uh, I'm a writer. I teach a broad range of classes and uh, very excited to talk about the Mary Eliza Project today, which is one of the you know, public facing initiatives that I am working on on an ongoing basis. Thank you. Molly, welcome. A little bit about yourself, please. Thank you. Yeah, I um, I am a recent graduate of Simmons, where I started working on this project as a research assistant under um, Laura, and I'm now currently a contracted um, worker with the city of Boston to continue transcribing now that I've graduated and um, I'm looking into um, hopefully continuing to work in archives and, and public history. Wonderful, thank you. Erin, welcome. A few words about yourself, please. Thank you. Yeah, I'm Erin Wiebe, um, and similar to Molly, I started on this project as a graduate assistant, um, and now I'm a contractor through the Boston City Archives. Um, I'm a recent graduate of Simmons University's Archives and History dual degree program, um, and I actually just started a position as the digital archives intern uh, for the National Park Service's Longfellow House, Washington's headquarters, uh, historic home in Cambridge. Terrific, terrific. Anna, would you continue with a little bit of your background, please? Hi, thank you so much for having us. Um, I'm Anna. I'm currently a graduate student at Simmons University, studying both history and archives management. Uh, like the others, I'm also a contractor with the city transcribing women's voter registers. And I'm also working with uh, Laura to research and write blog posts for the city of Boston's website, interpreting the data. Terrific, terrific. Laura, can you start from the beginning and give us a little bit about the history and the mission of the project? Yes, of course. Uh, I guess of the four of us, I'm the one who was there at the birth of the project. So uh, I'm indicated. Um, as I uh, mentioned in my intro, I'm currently the public humanities chair uh, in the Eiffel College at Simmons University. And in a way, the roots of this project go back to 2019-2020. Uh, I was uh, thinking of different projects that would connect with the centennial celebrations of the 19th Amendment. Mm -hmm. That's the amendment to the U.S. Constitution that extended the right to vote to women in the United States. And um, I was especially interested in thinking of that 19th Amendment as, as a kind of turning point, as an end point. So I was interested in 
you know, as much what it's it started uh, as what it closed off. Uh, you know, it kind of closed off a certain phase of the suffrage movement, but um, it also opened up new possibilities, including for women engaging in politics. And uh, Marta Crilly, who is an archivist with the city of Boston, um, she told me about these women's voter register books that were in their collections. Um, I've worked with Marta before on other projects. Um, she's a, a very dear colleague of mine at this point. And so she knew my interest would be captivated by these, um, especially my background in women's history, my interest in suffrage. Um, so we can tell you some more about this as things go on, but you know, they were there were separate books for women to register to vote because up until 1920, um, Boston women did not have the right to vote. Um, in 1879, they were given by state law the right to vote just for school boards. Um, so the city started keeping different books for the very, very limited right to vote just in school board elections that women mm -hmm. could have. Um, so in the wonderful collections of the city of Boston, which are open to the public, there were, I think, about 90, right, about 90 different volumes covering the 26 wards of the city that had all of this information about women registering to vote. Um, and as you mentioned, Jay, over 50,000 women flocked to register to vote when they had full voting rights. So from mid-August to mid-October in 1920, which was an election year, they really overwhelmed the system. So there were these books with 50,000, not just names, but addresses, ages, occupations listed, um, information about citizenship and naturalization, just a, a lot of like great data, um, which is really valuable. I mean, for local history, for family history. Um, I had a lot of questions as a researcher about, you know, who these women actually were, who were claiming the right to vote. Um, were there women of color registering to vote in Boston in 1920? Um, immigrant women, working class women, women who really didn't have the leisure time uh, or ability to be leaders in the national movement uh, to gain the right to vote, but could still, like by their actions, just claiming the right to vote when they got it, mm -hmm. um, proclaim themselves as suffragists. So for me, this was also kind of broadening out the definition of, of what a suffragist was. Um, so lots of exciting potential, but the registers themselves were really difficult to use. They're handwritten for one thing. And mm -hmm. we've had our adventures trying to interpret some of the handwriting, especially of these clerks overwhelmed by lines and lines of women, right? Rushing through, um, some of them making some assumptions about the individuals who were presenting themselves to register to vote to. Um, we can tell some stories around that. Sure. Um, so handwritten, um, but also not indexed. Um, and the way that the city conducted this registration, uh, it was organized by city ward. So geographically, um, each city ward had a, had a place that um, women could register or more than one place. Um, but any Boston resident woman could register to vote in any ward. So you'll find women who live in one neighborhood registering in another. Maybe they worked in a department store downtown during the day and they went on their lunch hour. So um, you couldn't even really target uh, a, a particular neighborhood in the city to find the names you were looking for. Um, Terrific. And I know we're going to be hearing uh, each of your insights into the data shortly. So yeah. let's continue. Anna, just a brief word, please about who Mary Eliza Mahoney was and why the project's named after her. Sure. Um, so Mary Eliza Mahoney was actually born in Boston, in Boston's West End neighborhood in 1845. And she was the first Black woman to graduate from a nursing program in the United States. And in addition to that, she worked to end racial discrimination within the nursing community. And she was cited as one of the first women in Boston who registered to vote after the 19th Amendment passed. Um, so when we first started our project, we were really eager to find her in the records, but we weren't entirely sure where she lived. Um, so we began with one of the more racially diverse neighborhoods, um, like the South End and parts of Roxbury. And very soon we did actually find her. She registered on August 
1920. And indeed, she was one of the first few hundred women in Boston who registered to vote. And she lived at 48 Warwick Street, which is near the present day intersection of Tremont Street and Melnia Cass Boulevard. Mm -hmm. Anna, what motivated you to join the project? Sure. Um, So I really enjoy urban history, working women and the built environment. And this uh, project really allowed me to kind of investigate all of those interests. Mm -hmm. And I really enjoyed, you know, as we said, each new ward book or even each new page of a book reveals something interesting and you stumble across, you know, an interesting new place of business or a hotel. Um, and it's it's always interesting. Each new page reveals something interesting. Erin, what drew you to the project and what's kept you focused on it? Yeah, so I I really enjoyed getting to tell, you know, intersectional women's stories for a public audience, um, being part of a project that is connecting people with history that matters to them, history that may be local to them. Um, and and getting to expand that story of, you know, what is the story of American women's suffrage? Um, moving forward, a big part of my research has been um, finding ways to map the data set um, and present these voter registrations in a spatial way, in a visual way. Um, we've had some explorations into uh, Google Maps projects, um, which have been really fun ways to Um, see where women lived and worked and formed communities across the city, um, which is information that we can pull from these voter registers. I know it's so rich uh, what you've accomplished so far. And Molly, your motivation for being uh, attracted to the project. Yeah, similar to what both Erin and Anna have said, I um, initially was just drawn in by a real interest in urban history. I also grew up in the Boston suburbs and so have always had a very strong interest in Boston history. And this just seemed like a wonderful opportunity to learn about a group of people who are um, really understudied and and not as well understood because they don't show up as much in our historical record. Um, And as the other two have also said, it's just continued to be an interesting experience where um, with each new word book that I go through, a new um, neighborhood that I'm I'm going through, more communities of women, individual stories keep popping up that are really remarkable, um, especially the everyday women. Um, you know, we find famous figures, but I think it's the um, just sort of the normal everyday person who has an interesting part of her history that kind of keeps it keeps it really exciting. Yeah, I think that point in particular is what's attracted me to the project and what we can learn about history um, from studying everyday people like ourselves. Laura, before we move on, uh, just a few words about other members who have contributed to the project. Yes, because this is not our whole team. Um, Thank you, Jay, for that opportunity. So um, Marta Crilly, who I've mentioned as my uh, co-director, would not be able to conduct this um, project without her. Um, There's also uh, transcription work um, and blogging that's uh, been done by Coco Lynch, um, who is another a uh, current graduate student in history and archives at Simmons. And then this past year, we've had two undergraduates join the team. They are history majors at Simmons, um, Daniela Gilveras and Kaz Gebhardt. Um, they have started looking at the registers before 1920. Um, and so we have uh, some beginning data from that also up on the, the portal um, to see what women were registering for for school suffrage as well. Um, And if I could add to what um, my team has said so far, uh, you know, we opted to use a really simple database. I mean, we work in um, Google Sheets (laughs) uh, because we wanted to make this information as easy for uh, users to, to, to play with. Um, and we really encourage people to just go onto the portal and do their own research and their own findings. So we do some interpreting, but really it was about engaging people in this really relatable history of everyday people. So you can look up your own address, um, for example, you know, was there a, a suffragist? Was there a voter at this address in, in 1920? Um, 
family names uh, or look for an occupation that catches your interest. There's lots of ways to play with the data. You know, and Aaron, in addition to uh, individual uses, like Laura just suggested, what are some of the groups and audiences that you see the project directed for? Yeah, so that's that's something that we especially wanted to highlight today was that um, we wanted the project to be used by a really wide range of people. Um, you know, we typically think of, you know, researchers and genealogists and historians, which um, I think would find this data set and have found it very valuable, um, but also students and teachers. Um, we've already heard from some teachers and professors who have used this in their classroom and integrated it into their curriculum to look at women's history, to look at early 20th century history. Um, yeah, and as Laura said, those researching family history. Um, we've also heard from people who have found family members in the books, which I think I can speak for all of us was incredibly gratifying um, that people were already making those really personal connections um, and being able to find out more about their own family history. And um, yeah, so so kind of the, maybe the more, I don't know if we'd call it serious research, but also people interested in, you know, who in my building signed up to vote, who in my neighborhood, um, and even who in my, maybe my immigrant community or my ethnic and religious community um, claimed the right to vote in 1920, um, and how, you know, seeing those impacts in the present day as well. Mm -hmm. Nice, nice. Lara, before we hear some of the other insights and even a few stories from each of you, would you just add a little bit more to give us a full overview of the various information and documents that the uh, database contain? Oh, sure. So the um, registers themselves they're almost laid out like a database, which is what mm. caught our interest. So each woman um, who presented herself to register had to give her her name. Her uh, So there's first and last names. There's an, a home address. There's an occupation. There's an age listed, although not a birth date. Um, there uh, is a, a address for the employer. Um, there's also a bunch of fields that we've captured about US citizenship, um, which is a complicated question, but at this time in 1920, a woman's citizenship came from her husband. So sometimes there's a lot of information about husbands and even fathers and other family members. Um, so if a US born woman married a man of a different nationality, she lost her US nationality um, and citizenship. Um, and the same if an immigrant woman married a U.S. national, a U.S. citizen, um, she gained that. So there's all kinds of that in information as well. Um, there's no field for uh, race or ethnicity, for example, but there's a lot of cross-referencing um, that we can do with census records, for example, and other kinds of records. And that's the background research that goes into some of the um, blogs that we write. And eventually, uh, when we're done, we hope to have an exhibit that will, again, have a lot of that uh, other background information uh, to put things into context and help tell the stories. Yeah, I've had the good fortune to read a number of those blogs. They're extremely well written. And you can also find corresponding images that just enrich the entries that much more. Well, yeah, it's like the, the registers are like an, a window, really, that mm -hmm. opens up a lot more. Nicely put. Molly, looking from your time of involvement, what's one insight or story that strikes you from being involved and looking over the data? Yeah, I'm going to pull from a more recent one. Um, I'm currently transcribing Ward number five, which is the voting district that includes most of the North End and uh, the West End in downtown Boston. Um, and to kind of jump off of what Laura was saying about citizenship, there's a lot of interesting notes um, around citizenship and marital status that crop up. And I found a really intriguing one about a woman who reclaimed her citizenship um, after she was widowed. And she, um, her name was Helen Motts. She was born in Charlestown. And um, when she was younger, she married a Canadian man 
This was before 1907 when um, the Expatriation Act went into effect, and that's what Laura was talking about, where American women assumed the nationality of their foreign-born husband. Um, so at the time, she only lost her American citizenship when she lost the United States, and she did move to uh, New Brunswick, back to where her husband's family was. They had three sons, but then he tragically died of yellow fever. So she moved back to her family in Malden. Um, and in 1920, we find her working as a matron at the Charles Street um, or Suffolk County Jail. Um, and the note says she reclaimed her citizenship. So it's just a small insight into kind of what this woman went through in her life with her citizenship and then being able to come back and claim her right to vote as an American citizen much later in life. Yeah, no, that's a fascinating example of what you can piece together from the data that you find in these records. Thank you for sharing. Erin, um, could you give an example that strikes you? Yeah, so I, I wanted to give an example of um, how this data set can show um, stories of women kind of on a larger community scale, but also on an individual level. Um, so we found in the registers um, many women signing up to vote who lived in the Franklin Square House in Boston's South End neighborhood. Um, and it was an apartment building for working and student women. And in the early 1900s, it could house up to 800 women at a time. Um, so what we found in the books was really exciting. Um, we found over 100 uh, residents of this apartment building signing up to vote in 1920. Um, representing a really wide range of backgrounds and occupations. Um, many of them signed up together. You can see their names are beside each other on the page. Um, and any one of those residents, you could do a deep dive on and find some really fascinating stories. Um, but one in particular was Mariah L. Baldwin, um, who showed up in the register books that I was transcribing. Um, so she lived at the Franklin Square House. Um, and she was a prominent African-American educator, civil rights activist, and suffragist over her entire life. Um, the clerk actually recorded her occupation as simply teacher at the Agassiz School in Cambridge. Um, but this was really obscuring her true role as the principal of the school. Um, <laughs> uh, and what at the time, it was a predominantly white school. so. Um, she was really breaking some barriers at the time. Um, the school is actually named after her today uh, in her honor, and it's still open. Um, but Baldwin was an early member of the NAACP, uh, first president of the League of Women for Community Service uh, in Boston, among many other social justice efforts. So that's just one example of um, doing a deep dive on an individual. Yeah, as well. and I very much enjoyed the blog posting uh, about uh, Franklin Square House. So thank you for sharing that. Anna, just a quick word to insight story that strikes you. Sure. Um, so I was actually born in Mississippi uh, and moved to Boston five years ago for school. So I was kind of looking for my own I don't know, story in the registers. And I was excited to find so many Southern women. We found hundreds of women from a lot from Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, et cetera. Um, and this it really reflects kind of what was happening in the country at the time. Thousands of Black Americans were leaving the South at the time between 1914 and 1920, upwards of 50,000 black Americans left the South and relocated uh, to Northern states, Western states. And we see that in registers uh, reflecting the moving here to Boston. Um, and one woman that I ran across who was particularly interesting was Mary Johnson. Um, interestingly enough in the record, she's uh, recorded as a housewife by the, by the clerk, but her professional experience is much more complex than that. She was born in Virginia and moved to Boston, and she and her husband started a hair care manufacturing business for African-American hair. Their mm -hmm. most famous product was known as Johnson's Hair Food, and they had a beauty school with two locations in the South End. Um, and I was really excited to find her in the registers. Nice. Thank you very much. Erin, what's the current status of the project? Yeah, so let me 
look at my numbers to make sure I'm getting this correct. Um, <laughs> yes, so we have uh, over 22,800 transcribed entries on our publicly available data set so far. Um, this is covering 13 wards out of 26. Um, so these wards are covering the neighborhoods of East Boston, Charlestown, uh, the South End, Mission Hill and Fenway, uh, Back Bay, and then large parts of Roxbury and Dorchester. Um, so we're actively releasing data for new wards. We actually just released uh, Ward 4 in Charlestown and Ward 18 in Dorchester. Um, and we expect to complete our transcriptions um, sometime next year uh, in the spring of 2024. Uh, so between now and then, we'll still be releasing new wards as they're completed. So um, anytime you check into the data set, it's probably gonna be bigger. Um, besides releasing uh, new data uh, into this uh, freely downloadable uh, spreadsheet, um, as we've already talked about, we've been writing blog posts, um, also social media posts, uh, and then doing public programs, uh, both in person and virtually like this one. Um, so we hope to continue to connect with people uh, in as many ways as we can. Um, nice. And I don't know if Laura had a few more words about kind of yeah, future Laura, plans. Building on Aaron's yeah. uh, comments, would you just share a little bit more about upcoming plans? Upcoming plans. We um, already have started producing a newsletter about once a month. Um, so uh, we'd, we'd be happy to figure out a way to sh sh share um, if any of your viewers want to sign up for that newsletter. Um, there is a place to sign up right on the portal on the City of Boston website. Uh, if you do a search for Mary Eliza Project, um, should turn it up. And yes, we're right on schedule to finish all the transcriptions um, by next spring. And this is thanks largely to a community preservation grant uh, mm -hmm. that we obtained from the city of Boston, um, which is why we can have contractors um, taking on more of this transcription work. Um, once we're finished, we are already starting to plan for an exhibit or possibly exhibits. Um, so something digital seems indicated since the whole project is digital, but we've also talked about possible um, pop-up exhibits in different neighborhoods around Boston. Um, and so thankful for all the interest in our project. We hope to continue to do presentations and workshops for community groups, libraries, um, would love to talk to more schools and teachers about how they can also use this database in their classrooms. Yeah, terrific. Oh, it's a great idea to follow up in all the neighborhoods would be uh, of high interest for sure. Molly, in closing, could you just add a little bit more to uh, what Laura mentioned, how viewers and others can stay up to date about the project and developments? Yeah, absolutely. So as Laura mentioned, we have a newsletter um, that gets sent out every few months or so. Um, we always include links to um, current blog posts that have gone up. Um, we also like to share little insights that we found. Um, so signing up for the newsletter is definitely the most direct way to stay on top of what we're doing. Um, but I would also like to shout out a collaborator of ours. Um, Laura Kitchings is a scholar who, um, once we upload each new um, data set, she crunches the numbers and does these really incredible data visualizations. Um, so kind of can show on a map how many women are coming from different states in the United States or different countries in Europe, um, shows the breakdown of different occupations by neighborhood. So that gets updated with every word data set that we upload. So I would recommend checking that out. Um, and then lastly, we like to collaborate with people over social media as well. So um, as, as Laura also mentioned, some of the handwriting is a little difficult to decipher. So we will take some of our toughest cases to Twitter and Facebook. So if you follow um, the City of Boston Archives account, sometimes um, we ask for help and have gotten some really uh, wonderful responses and have really actually helped us identify um, places and names. So we'd like to ask more people to do that. <laughs> Terrific idea. Well, unfortunately, we've come to the end of the program. I want to thank all of you for taking time to be here. It's been fascinating to find out more about the project. Eager to get back to the database myself and look forward to uh, upcoming newsletters to stay up to date. 
Thanks again and continued success with future endeavors. Thank you. Thank, thank you, so, you much, so much. Jane. Thank you. I also want to thank those of you watching for joining us and hope you'll be able to tune in next time. Thank you.